everyone. Um, this is a video series as part of the Startup Guide 2024 by Dubai Chamber of Digital Economy. Hello, Elal. Nice to have you. It's a pleasure being here. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining us as part of the um, Startup Guide, which is hosted by uh, Dubai Chamber. So, Elal, you're the co-founder and co-CEO of uh, Loon Technologies. So, can you tell us a bit more about what Loon does and what problem are you looking to solve as part of uh, the Loon product suite? So it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for the opportunity and the time. Uh, the support of Dubai Chambers throughout the years has been fantastic for us. Uh, so start starting by, with that. A quick background about what we do at Loon. So it has to start with a quick background about you know how we started it. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I'm a lawyer by training. So first question is, mm -hmm. what are you doing? And uh, I studied in England, and then I was working in the Dubai courts. And they, there, I, with my co-founder, that's my high school best friend, uh, I discovered a problem relating to financial literacy, which is that a lot of people, used, like out of 10 cases I would get, eight would be, uh, you know, debt to banks. Mm. That coupled with our, you know, entrepreneurship tendencies that we had, this was in 2019, uh, you know, made us ask a lot of questions. It's like, why, why is it this the case? What is it that's the biggest impediment for these individuals? Why are they end, ending up here? And I've been speaking to them for four years. I was four years on the courts. And there was a theme that kept recurring, which is the fact that halal, yes, I, I have a salary, I have a job, but like, you know, I don't know where my money is going. I don't understand where it's going. And uh, just things got messy and I don't, uh, uh, you know, I ended up here. Mm. Now they're in debt and they're in trouble. Not a great situation for the individual, not a great in the situation for the financial institution, not a great institu uh, situation for society in general or the government. So I started looking into the digital offerings of financial institutions in the Middle East and around the world. And we realized that the majority, not the majority, all banks, not even one bank could tell you as an individual where you spent your money. Mm -hmm. Open up your mobile banking app today. I'm not going to ask which bank, but like <laughs> anyone. How much did I spend on fuel last month? How much did I spend on entertainment? Yeah. Those who are savvy, like financially savvy and would go and you know, spend that you know, end of the month building an Excel sheet and like, looking at the transactions, yeah. they will still face a problem, which is the fact that when you go through your bank statement, I can guarantee half of the time there are some transactions that don't make any sense, that you cannot remember. That keeps happening to me. Long story short, I'm not gonna uh, go into too many, too many details, but that, that was the start of the, so we decided, okay, let's build something to help people save money. So we created you know, something a little bit different on you know, a mobile app towards social savings. And then we realized this is not going to work in this market due to the regulatory constraints. And then we pivoted that business model into a, what we call it a personal finance management application, which mm -hmm. is an app basically designed for me and you to be able to understand where our expenses are going. Uh, there are some models or like proven business models in this concept in different markets. However, here, we discovered another problem. So this is a story of entrepreneurship. You don't just start with an idea and yeah. it doesn't work. You know? uh, we discovered another problem, which is the fact that, okay, uh, the data we were getting from the financial institutions, yeah. from your payment data, your transaction data, was completely not usable. It was a mess. You swipe your card at Costa, you're going to see Emirates Leisure. What's the correlation between Amherst Leisure and Costa? Why is it that I'm seeing this on my bank statement? Yeah. So this is an infrastructure problem that we discovered again throughout our th that journey. Then that was another learning curve. We're like, okay, we learned a lot because we didn't have any idea about you know how to build a venture here, regulation, mm -hmm. etc. We learned those first couple of years were learning painfully, but uh, learning, spending all our savings. Uh, but we got there. And we discovered this problem and we discovered that no one was solving for it. And this is a gap for financial institutions, for banks, for the fintech ecosystem that is now growing, not just in the UAE, but the whole GCC and the Middle East. 
you had a lot of business models come up, all new kinds of business models within the fintech and neo banking, mm -hmm. and even traditional old school traditional banks were trying to digitize, but then they're go always going to face this problem. So we decided that we're going to shelve the mobile app that we did, which was B2C, B2C. Mm -hmm. and we are going to focus B2B, and we're going to now sell to banks. And had, again, zero idea how to do this, you know, like, no one in our network to ask, you know, no one has a company that sells software to banks. Usually the, the technology providers for financial institutions are all outside of the UAE. Very few are in the UAE yeah. or the GCC in general. Yeah. So that was a very long uh, learning curve. So today, uh, but that was, alhamdulillah, that was, you know, by the grace of God, we managed to get the first client, get the first investment round. Yeah. That was also another story, very difficult. Uh, but then we, you know, one step at a time, now we have more than 10 clients, uh, including some of the largest banks in the UAE. And today we're live, not just in the UAE, but in the UAE and Saudi Arabia and then Bahrain. Mm -hmm. And we're looking to expand more in the GCC and then focus beyond that. But at the core of what we do is financial data analytics for financial institutions by yeah. solving this infrastructure problem, solving this uh, data issue that is a value inhibitor for these financial institutions. Okay. I gave you the long story and then I summarized it mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really like the, the label of the transactions that are not, that are hard to comprehend. So you guys are doing kind of like data enrichment? Exactly. To help with? That is exactly the, the, okay. the concept because, the, it's, I'm not without going too, too technical, but it's, uh, data, yeah, tra transaction data enrichment. Yeah. So which is you take the transaction, through our engines and different methodologies, we identify that, okay, Emirates Leisure is actually Costa. Here is the logo, here is the category, yeah. here's the subcategory, here's additional information that we can get. And we do this, and then we build use cases on top of it. So value adding use cases for the financial institution, okay. be it analytics, be it uh, you know, customer experience, and uh, we build on top of it. And uh, in, in terms of uh, product, uh Development. What are the, the big um, use cases that you're working towards, or some of the big products? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? The the biggest value I see from this is starts from a simple question. So today, if we you know, ask any stakeholder within even the largest financial institution, mm -hmm. the GCC, where did Emirati ladies spend in Ramadan? What's their favorite brand? I can guarantee 99.9% .9 that there will be no answer. So what does this tell you about the ability and data analytics ability and capabilities and the value that's just sitting there that's not being tapped by financial institutions? You, know, you would think that you know, a very large financial institution, billions of revenue and profit <laughs> knows what's happening in their customer base, retail or corporate, but the reality is that we're not there yet. Yeah. We're seeing in other uh, markets such as uh, the United States, financial institutions realize, uh, I think it was Chase Bank, realize that, okay, like financial services is the core of what we do, but there's so much more opportunity to increase revenues from other streams. And this sits within the data aspect. So they took an approach whereby they're allowing retailers or like companies to advertise to their clients based on their spending on their apps. Yeah. See, that this is another revenue stream that they opened up. So the potential with data is, is huge. And in the end of the day, financial institutions are commercial entities. This is a huge other revenue stream that will give you better customer experience, lower increased financial literacy, lower default rates, and you know, it is the future. I have an article coming up uh, in the next couple of months, that's, you know, the future of financial industry is going to be uh, specifically you know, data-driven finance. That's yeah. the future. The start was financial products. This was back in the day where there was no digital solution or digital channels. Then in the 2000s, we got digital channels. I remember like five years ago, my bank didn't have like a functioning mobile app. You know, and, uh, just having an app meant you, you, the bank is digital. That's not <laughs> the case. Now the future is, is, is in the data. Yeah. That, is, that is where the true value lies. And it's not, 
One of the biggest challenges that we had was the fact that we are building an innovative solution that didn't make sense to a lot of people at the time because we were not copying a business model in a different market. Mm -hmm. A lot of investors, it's funny, you know, like, Hilal, who are you copying in America? I'm not copying anyone. We'd much rather appreciate, you know, it's easier for us to invest if you were just like, show us that you're copying a business model that worked in a developed market. It makes us more comfortable. But there is a huge difference. This is a different market. The UAE is different. GCC is different. It's not yeah. the States, not Europe. Huge, a lot of difference in terms of regulation, in terms yeah. of a lot of these things. So yeah, that's... Uh, so a bit of education with VCs, huh? That's uh, another video call. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so you launched 2019. 2020. 2020. And then when did you, when did you pivot to the B2B model? Yeah, great question. So we started building the idea end of 2019. Okay. We're still in our jobs. And then, you know, you got, I always say there's three phases to entrepreneurship, especially when you have an idea to start mm -hmm. a business. And this is hopefully helpful piece of experience or advice I'm sharing to the viewers to the fact that we all have great ideas. We all have great ideas. I'm sure you and your, like, your university or after university come up with this great idea. Mm -hmm. You get very excited about it. You start working, you start planning, you start you know, developing the idea and you fall into a lot of traps. And then after a month, that excitement fades away. So when it fades away, this is the actual, <laughs> building a company is very difficult. So. This is where a lot of people just shelve it and go back to their normal yeah. lives for whatever excuse. For us, it was the end of 2019. We started developing the idea and then, you know, there was momentum by myself and my co-founder, our very early idea, which is social savings. And then we, uh, COVID hit. And we were like, okay, we're in lockdown, 30 days. Like, okay, this is a sign from God. We have nothing to do. Let's start developing the idea. Yeah. And, uh, that's when really, you know, we started focusing on it and uh, we incorporated the company. Things were getting serious. November 2020, I quit my job. My co-founder quit his job and like my HR manager and the courts was like, are you crazy? You know, like no one's going to hire you. Like it's, it's COVID. Like there's no jobs. Are you sure you want to yeah. leave? And at that time, I couldn't uh, manage two. And I knew deep inside, like, if I didn't, like, go full in, it at some point, we were just going to fall back. Yeah. It's not going to work. So we took that plunge, invested our savings up until it was, so it was almost, say, like, March 2021. Mm -hmm. We realized that the social savings app that we wanted to build was not feasible because of the regulatory constraints that we had, because of the infrastructure constraints that we had. And, you know, we're stuck there. We don't have any revenue, we don't have any income, and we uh, you know, yeah. spent a lot of our savings. And we hired the team, so we had people on our payroll, and we were like, okay, we shouldn't uh, just shelve this. So that's when we pivoted to the PFM. And the story there was the fact we were sitting with some of our early clients, and they're like, Halal, the social savings app is a fantastic idea. By the way, it's a, it's a very, I'm not gonna go into too much details about social savings, but it's a very, prevalent uh, cultural practice between a lot mm -hmm. of the nationalities in the UAE where they come together and they pull in money together yeah. in an unofficial way that had a lot of risks. But basically, we're sitting with those customers like pondering, what do we do? We have a couple of months of runway and they're like, okay, halal, like, this is great, but like, we don't even know where our money is going in the first place before we do savings. Give me an app to help me manage, understand where I'm spending my money. This is where we pivoted to the PFM in mm -hmm. a B2C app. Still B2C. So we redeveloped the app. We had the app. We just redeveloped it and launched it and it was growing. There was a lot of demand. People were, you know, over 3,000 customers and people were using it and uh, a lot of feedback and things were going well. But then we realized that, okay, investors were not going to invest in this business model in their eyes because, again, they see the example that happened in the States and they don't see this as very scalable. If we we're gonna run this as a business, we needed volumes and, you know, we realized that there's limitations to the business model. And we needed to be regulated if we wanted to take a specific path, mm -hmm. which is like, the invest and 
by that time, I just didn't want to do anything with financial regulation. It's, it's, it's a startup killer in the region. Mm -hmm. Because unlike other markets where you just, it's very clear, you just apply for a license, you get access to a large market here, you have to apply for the UAE. You go to Saudi, it's a different story. You go to Bahrain, it's a different yeah. story. So you can't really get that mass and it's very costly. And that's when, uh, as I mentioned in the start, that's when we discovered the problem again with the data. Yeah. I'm like, okay, we, here's our learnings. B2C is painful, regulated is painful. We're gonna do B2B and we're gonna uh, non-regulated, just providing technology. And we'll see where that goes. And that, that was our second pivot, basically. That was in 20, don't recall really, 2022, uh, 2022. Okay. And then in uh, September, I think 2022, we raised our first pre-seed round. Okay. Uh, that was also you know, a challenge. But then we grew, we started getting customers, and alhamdulillah, things progressed one step at a time. And uh, have you raised money since the the pre-seed? Yes, we just closed the seed round uh, okay. two weeks ago. Congratulations. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of learnings, you know, I would, I would share with people, which is the fact that, you know, people glorify raising money as if this is an achievement. Yeah. This is not an achievement, respectfully. This is a commitment, a, a, commitment, a responsibility. Yeah. This is other people's money. money. Yeah. And you have an obligation towards this. And like the more you raise, the more, you know, it's, it's a bit, uh, so that's why we limited our raise to this comparatively small amount. And focused, and you have to focus on the business fundamentals. That's one of the learnings we learned. You have to, business, it's a business. It's not a startup, it's not entrepreneurship, it's not any of these, fun, it's a money making business. If you don't have a money making business, you have a problem. And okay, the, there are some strategies that are, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make money now, I'm gonna grow. And then I will make money in the future. And that was one of the assumptions we had in our old business model, because either of them were not gonna generate revenue from day yeah. one. But that is fluid, because that is built on an assumption that you'll always get investors that are gonna give you money, money to be yeah. able to continue your runway, while that's not the case, and we saw this, in, 2020, 2021, raising money was very easy, and then you had a lot of issues after that. So, a couple of things I uh, we learned throughout the way, you know, sharing for uh, you know, it's exciting though. benefits of people. Yeah. yeah. So when you were when you first uh, launched the business, what were the government incentives or support that you were provided by? Dubai, um, whether that is the city, the government, or any, any of its uh, digital economy, um, that has helped Loon in setting up the business in, uh, in Dubai? No, absolutely. And one of the things I keep saying, uh, I've said this in another podcast, I've said this in another, uh, a lot of, I've, in a lot of interviews, we are the luckiest people in the world to be able to build a business in this mm -hmm. market. Nowhere else in the world will you have such a supportive ecosystem. You want to start a business, it's this easy. How many jurisdictions do you have? You want to start a, within the tech field, you have how many accelerators and incubators and uh, you know, centers to start your business. So when we started, we started in the DIFC during COVID. Uh, uh, and that was you know, very supportive uh, in terms of the programs, in terms of the perks, in terms of the subsidies they gave mm -hmm. us. Granted, the, you know, there is a lot of more things that could be done. And this is, uh, we, we always share this with uh, government uh, okay. stakeholders, including Dubai Chambers, including other entities in Dubai. And they're, the, the beautiful thing is that they're very, uh, how can you say it, responsive. Oh, responsive. And they're there to hear from you. Mm -hmm. So where, where else in the world are you gonna ha get access to a minister or the you know, head of a department? to share this feedback and they'll listen attentively and they'll take action on top of it. So this is, this is really what makes Dubai very, you know, very unique. So you've seen, uh, even since you launched, you've seen uh, the ecosystem, the support growing since then, like with the feedback that have been given by yourself, by other startups, you've seen the, the ecosystem mature and the, the support that they give startups. Absolutely. And 
There is always a lot more to be done. Yeah. So we need more, I've shared this, we need more funds, more early stage VC funds, mm -hmm. more, uh, you know, accelerators that actually invest, more, you know, targeted, you know, grants. We don't have grants, okay. research grants. So mm -hmm. this, it's coming, but uh, from what I've heard, but, you know, research grants into artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So there's a lot of these uh, things that can be improved, but the beautiful thing is that we've shared it. It has been, you know, uh, received, and I'm sure now it will be improved. Worked on. So Dubai has set its sight to becoming, a, you know, a digital economy capital in the world. By the end of the decade, um, and it opened its border, you know, with the green nomad visa, the golden visa and various other initiatives to attract advanced technology companies and talent in the region um, to set their, you know, their roots in the, in the Emirates. Um, have these been um, instrumental for attracting talents for Lune? Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. We're getting, you know, this is a very good point. In the last couple of years, I would say in the last 18 months, yeah. been getting a lot and a lot of more inbound, you know, messaging from people in other markets, in Europe, in Canada, in the States, like, I'd, I'd like to move to Dubai. Is there, a, like, is there an opportunity with Loon, for example? So you're really seeing that, uh, you know, the shift from having to attract and pull people from other markets to come here mm -hmm. to the fact that those individuals actually want to come here. Uh, and they, they move and they're looking for opportunities. So clearly, the, the, these policies that have been implemented the last couple of years have had huge potential, mm -hmm. a huge positive impact on this. So you guys are actively uh, recruiting and... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, we're, we're actively hiring, guess right now. Okay. Uh, our team is... Uh, you know, big chunk of it is here in Dubai, and then okay. we have people around the world now. Uh, one of the... Greatest thing that has happened since COVID, uh, just the, I think, interconnectivity of the world has increased, you know, with remote working. Yeah. Now you, have, you, you can uh, have access to, you know, the pool of talent has expanded exponentially. So that's, uh, that's a lot of, you know, positive things that have happened since then. Culture has changed, the work culture. Um, can you speak about the ease of access to capital in the region? Um, and the advantages that startups have, um, which are HQ'd in Dubai. So you've talked about, you know, the, the pre-seed and the seed. Um, can you expand a bit more on the ease of access to capital in the region? So I, I think we still have a long way to go, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to ease of access to capital, especially in the UAE. Um, we're seeing the whole, the whole, whole ecosystem in the region is growing, um, exponential growth. But we still have this issue of uh, access to capital here in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason being is that we have very few real early stage venture capital funds that actually invest in, that are purely venture capital. Venture capital is th having the appetite to take that big risk at that very early yeah. stage. Yeah. We don't have that. What we have right now is a lot of, uh, I'm not saying we don't have that. We have a few, but we need more. What we have today is a lot of venture capital f funds that act as like growth private equity. Yeah, it's two a, different things. Yeah, yeah. So we still have a long way to go there. Uh, the angel investing culture also yeah. has a lot. To, uh, we need to improve that. Uh, in different markets, we've experienced you know angel investors, you know, very quick move, they can move fast, that really start building the momentum for you. We haven't seen this a lot here in the UAE. And also with the early stage funds. One of the most beneficial and one of the very positive uh, developments that have happened in the last few years is the launch and establishment of the Dubai Future District Fund, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is a collaboration between Dubai Future Foundation and the IFC. Yeah. And now we'll have other also LPs. This is was a fantastic development and that very specific theme on the future of finance, future, you know, very specific themes, but uh, we needed that. 
we really needed a, a fund that would you know really capitalize and you know move the ecosystem and we need more uh, we need more and we need them to be more active and more uh, proactive we don't have a lot of accelerators that we have a lot of accelerators but uh, not many that actually invest so okay. you know you, yeah fa fantastic you put me in a three month project uh, the course and you made me develop my idea it's great but you know you, you don't get the I need something more you know, yeah subsidiary to get to get things moving yeah and uh, yeah what are the uh, opportunities and uh, advantages that Dubai has in its attempt to become the uh, the place to launch startups versus you know any other city in the region or per perhaps in the world from your st from your standpoint you know from what you've seen so far how attractive is Dubai from my experience that Dubai is one of the you know from the ease of doing business I cannot think of another jurisdiction that is as easy and simple to set up as Dubai. You can set up your business in any one of these, whether free zone, onshore, in like a week. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to mention other names, but other much more, you know, like we say, developed countries mm -hmm. in Europe, and it'll take you a few days. Much longer, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so to start, I don't think that there is another jurisdiction that is as easy in terms of ease of starting a business. I think that makes it very attractive for a lot of uh, companies abroad to set up here mm -hmm. in the region. Anything you'd like to share, a piece of advice? We have to emphasize that we got to... There, there's a clear direction by the UAE government to... I'm talking now within the scope of Marathi society. Mm -hmm get more people in the private sector, but also to reinvigorate the entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship let's say ethos. Dubai is a merchant city. It's been built by, you know, at the core of it from more than 200 years ago. And uh, now we need to refocus on that. So entrepreneurship is a vi viable option the fear is not, yes, there is fear, there is risks, there's other things, but this is a viable option that is an alternative to service in the public sector or working in the corporate world. This is a very you know, enriching experience, very difficult, very challenging, but it comes with the uh, positive impacts. And because, as we mentioned, that we are in one of the, you have such a supportive ecosystem, there is always like you, you have an idea, I don't know how to start. When I started, we didn't have these many accelerators and hubs, etc. But now today, you just have an idea, you know, and you want to develop the idea. There's so many different pathways to do that. Mm -hmm. So my 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 uh, two cents on this is that if you have an idea, and I'm sure you know, a lot of the viewers will be will have business ideas and you know uh, thoughts, is to action it. I said this before in another podcast. Take the first step. You know, yes, you have obligations. Perhaps you have you know full-time job. Perhaps you're still in university. But just take that first step and try. When the uh, the most important thing, when the excitement fades, don't stop. <laughs> this yeah. is the hard part. And uh, yeah, wish uh, wish all the best to, to everyone. I hope to see more and more founders come from the UAE for the UAE and globally also. Let's hope. Thank you very much, uh, Elal, for your time and uh, contribution. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. If you enjoyed this content, continue listening or watching to future episodes where we speak to many of Dubai's startup founders, investors, and digital economy and startup ecosystem enablers. Also, the Dubai Chamber of Digital Economy has published an annual startup guide to help answer any questions you may have on how to register and start a company in Dubai. Download the guide now at the Dubai Chamber of Digital Economy website.